Okay, we are recording. Um, hi, everybody. Barry suggested I call myself Dr. Angie. Kind of formal, kind of informal. <laughs> With Barry Kennedy today. I think you may officially be the elder in our polymath place group. The elder. The elder Barry. <laughs> the elder Barry. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> and nutritious. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've heard of elderberry jam and stuff. I see it at Ikea, I think. <laughs> anyway. Elderberry wine, too. <laughs> oh, that is funny. We should call you, elder, call you elderberry in our group. <laughs> so Barry is coming to us from Sherwood, Oregon. Uh, Barry, how old are you? Do you mind sharing? I'm 80. Oh, I'll awesome. be soon 81 in June. Awesome. Awesome. All right. And we're going to have fun talking about Barry's polymathy. We're going to do like a member highlight. We're going to talk about Barry's passion and what he's been working on. And, um, but to start, he wrote a poem. Barry writes poems. He paints. He does yoga. He does lots of cool stuff. So Barry, I'm going to hand it over to you to share your poem. Yeah, this, uh, thank you for inviting me, Dr. Angie. Uh, I'm, thank you for making me a, a person on Angie's list. <laughs> you are on Angie. You're on this Angie's list, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what I um, I used to work for Bonneville Power before I retired in 1999, and I have a master's in electrical engineering from Purdue, and uh, and I actually was in Washington D.C. for six months, and lived real near where you do, uh, Angie, and. Uh, and that was a transforming experience being there in Washington, D.C. And I found it ex extremely exhilarating. I love politics. I, it's not quite what I would like it to be today, but I, I enjoy the excitement that goes with it. And, uh, and so before I go into my poem, I want to share with you my dream this morning. And... Uh, um, and I dreamed I was looking for a restroom, and the restroom is a symbol of releasing your emotions in a public place, okay? And, uh, and but uh, I ran into this fellow that said, all you need to do is talk about and think about transformers and trees. And I said, what is that all about? So I used to design power transformers. And transformers uh, are a device for transforming voltage. Now, voltage in electrical engineering can be also called potential. And, if, and you cannot get energy unless you combine voltage with current flow. And current flow is the flow of electrons. And that produces watts. In fact, voltage times current mathematically equal watts, okay? And uh, so I, uh, I tend to spend so many years working as an electrical engineering engineer when I graduated Arizona State in 1964. And incidentally, I was interviewed by the NSA in 1964 um, to go to work for them. But I choose not to because they made me mad because they gave me a polygraph test and they said, uh, and they accused me of being queer or homosexual. And But they like to get you mad when they do a polygraph test. And that make, they think that you'll tell the truth when you're mad. But they made me so mad I didn't want to go to work for them. So I went to work for Westinghouse. And uh, so that kind of leads to my, I'm introducing all this for my my. Um, poem and my, my dream. So my first book that I wrote just before I retired was called, uh, let's see if I can get it around there. Can you see it? Oops, you got to get closer. What? Anyway. It's getting hard to, huh? It's getting yeah, blocked. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Oh, there it is. There's something. It's published by McGraw-Hill. It's called Energy Efficient Transformers. So I took my interest in energy efficiency and combined it with uh, my designing transformers for Westinghouse for three years before I went back to get graduate school at Purdue. Uh, 
Now, my second book is called Power Quality Primer. And in that book, I, the first chapter, I talk about Tesla, Nikola Tesla, and Thomas Edison and how they competed for AC and DC back in the early years of electricity. So that leads to my point. So that I'm working on my third book, which is called Energy Efficient Transformed Me. And uh, so I wrote this poem that kind of puts in a nutshell of what my book's going to be about. And I made a painting of this as well, of course, because uh, I, like, I like to look at my poems as my specifications, my paintings as my blueprint, if you want to use engineering terms, and my writing my memoir is my operating map. I love that. So... It's very polymathic. So, uh, it's very polymathic. <laughs> so, so I had this problem. I had this problem when I my wife went on dialysis, and she became, and she was, because we were married almost fifty years. Her name was Helen, and uh, and we met in in college at Arizona State. there and uh, she was a school teacher and I'm an INTJ or ENTJ so we're almost the opposite of each other in fact we went to a counselor and he says how do you live with each other and I said love so what was and that's the way we live together what and I was a, excuse me oh, sorry excuse what was the Myers-Briggs and what's yours again so uh hers was an ENFP which is called the artist okay and she has many paintings she did, although she was a school teacher. And mine was either, I'm an ambivert. I could be either an ENTJ or an INTJ. And as I get older, I become more of an INTJ. So anyway, ENTJ is called the executive or the INTJ is called the mastermind. Hmm. Okay. So uh, INTJs are about 1.8% of the population for males, and they are also, um, for females, they're 0.8%. And a lot of females that are INTJs have difficulty finding mates because INTJs tend to be masculine type uh, uh, traits, okay? And through my, my uh, wife uh, going through all of her sickness, I was her caregiver seven years before she died in 2014. And through all those that uh, I depend on my emotional and I asked myself, her caregiver as motions. And, I, and sure. so while I was uh, going through this process, I came up with an idea. I would use my engineering experiment experience to deal with my emotions. But these two things don't seem to be compatible. So I had to build a bridge from being a monomath engineer to a polymath artist, uh, poet, uh, that and dancer and um, you know and what else uh, yoga yogi and uh, all these things so I could deal with my emotions and so this poem I wrote is called Transform Me and it uh, in Bonneville Power it need to understand that to get, understand the poem their first dam was the Bonneville Dam. Now, they, they don't own the dam. They actually own the power lines that serve the loads in the Pacific Northwest and 700 miles long down to Los Angeles that they also use to serve California. It's called the Intertie. Anyway, um, there was, that was their first dam. And it's a hydroelectric dam. It's a, what they call a run of the river dam. And it was named after a famous French explorer, 
called Bonneville, who did actually explore in the Northwest. So I came up with the idea that um, I'm a power system. And that's what this coin is about. I, and it's called Transform Me. My floodgate gates I let my wife control. When she left, they did overflow. I could not control their flow. Flow on, transform me, flow on. Other people drain power from me, parents, peers, and preachers too, pedagogues, professionals, and progeny. Flow on, transform me, flow on. Dabrowski's vision would not let me rest. A better me he saw growing in my chest. My overexcitabilities, I did the rest. So flow on, Barry, flow on, transform me, flow on. In nature, I see energy efficiencies. It inspires me to overcome my deficiencies. I would lay in bed almost every night. I saw my wife's death, but never in fright. So flow on, transform me, flow on. As Bonneville Power, I saw power system deficiencies, told utilities how to improve their system efficiencies. Now I create ways to use my potential energies. So flow on, transform me, flow on. Now my floodgates, I let God's nature control, that his creative nature create in me who I want to flow. Like him, creative and calm, I wish to grow. So flow on, transform me flow on. So when I, when I, uh, my wife went on dialysis and I became extremely angry and frustrated and, uh, and I was wondering why. They said, Barry, you're angry. You, you know, what's, what's wrong with you? And I couldn't, and I thought it was just, you know, frustration with not being able to do the things I want to do. But I took a test. And I found out I'm an impact. So an empath is a person that absorbs emotions and energy from all the people and things around them. Then I read another book called Highly Sensitive People. And it's by Elaine, Dr. Elaine, um, what is her last name? You remember what it is, Anne? I don't remember, but I, I, I do the book. Yeah, oh. Dr. Elaine uh, Adhorn. Uh, uh, anyways, her book, has a test in it and I took that test and it shows I'm on the high end of high sensitivity. Now high sensitivity means that I hear things, I see things, I smell things, I touch things and I taste things with more intensity than the average person. Turns out 20% of the population are genetically predisposed to be highly sensitive. And I really believe I inherited this from my mother because she was very highly sensitive. So I have this combination. I'm an INTJ, which is a very logical, rational, engineering type of person. But I'm also highly, there are two people that live in me that are almost in conflict with each other. No wonder I'm not a real believer in astrology, but I'm a Gemini. I, was ask, so are you I have these two types in me. The logic rational person. Go ahead. You're going to say something? No? Okay. So there's a logical me and then there's this emotional me. Okay. So how do you get these two to live together? So I also took another test. I read a, a book by Dr. Drabonsky, who was a famous psychologist from the 60s who developed the theory of positive disintegration. And one of his basic theories is the necessary for positive disintegration. And that means taking your negative traits and becoming who you want to be. And it's, and it's these overexcitability. And there are five of them. They're imagination, emotion, their um, high sensitivity, psychomotor or high moving, and high intellect. All five of these things. And I took a test and I have all five. Okay. 
So I have all of these five overexcitabilities. I'm highly sensitive, I'm empathic, but also I have this emo um, emotionally kind of distant personality. having a bit of a bad internet connection here. Barry, are you there? Darn, I hate when that happens. Is the internet going to cooperate? Let's see if he comes back. In the meantime, one of the things I wanted to observe about Barry is that he's so good at analogy. There you okay. are. Okay. Okay, fine. So um, I'm giving a kind of a speech. Did you want to ask me some other? Well, you know, oh, I... go ahead. You you keep going. You keep going because you okay. were about something. Go ahead. So what? So going back to my dream of trees and transformers. So transformers are symbol symbols. Electrical transformers are meaning, meaning in life. Trees are symbols for growth and bearing fruit. So this dream is telling me that uh, this is really the key to my um, life is learning how to transform these personality traits, overexcitability, high sensitivity, empathic, into something that is positive. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is through polymathy. Because we are naturally not broken, we're not broken up into the silos like nature does. We're naturally polymaths. We have all these senses. We have all these traits. That's it's uh, it's the way we were built. And so I believe that being monomath, not only in your profession but in your daily life, is unhealthy. It is distorting how you're designed to be. And I did not discover this because until. I was forced to deal with it when my wife got sick and got on dialysis. And being an empath, when she was set down, so the routine would be when you go on dialysis, she was in a wheelchair, she had real bad arthritis. I'd wheel her into the arthritis, into the dialysis center, and I'd lift her and put her in the chair. And then I'd have to go in the next room because it's gotta be a, a, a sanitary situation and they stick a needle in her. And I could see her off in the distance. Mm -hmm. And I felt her being stuck by that needle. And I became angry at the person that was hurting her. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't on lanocaine like she was. The pain was worse in me than it was in her because I could not know how to where it was coming from. Coupled with the fact all the people in the dialysis center, all the patients were going through all kinds of emotions and pain. One guy was lost his limbs and he was, I had a Hartman bag and a Hartman bag. You know what that is? Don't you? That's where you, bag. yeah. So you can't, you can't expel your excrement through your rectum. You have to have this bag and he had that and it smelled and I could smell it because I have these high sensitive cement. So I have all these characteristics that make it difficult to be in a hospital or a dialysis center. Oh yeah. And I just was going nuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally nuts. And so what do I do? I thought, well, maybe the solutions, there's all this noise was, so I contacted the head of music therapy 
in Oregon and I had her come out to the dialysis. I said, can you transform this new noise into music? She says, no, I don't know how to do this, Barry. And then I, I, there's a guy from the church that we attended and he would come once a week and, and he wanted to talk about the church, but I didn't want to, <laughs> I just didn't want to hear any more things that were going on. And so we, I had, and also I had the problem, there were smokers when I entered it, my wife was on oxygen. Fortunately, they moved me and my wife to another dialysis center from the ones we went to originally. And this was in Tualatin. And this other one that had only 15 patients, the first one had 75. And uh, this one happened to be near Boone's Ferry Park. And I started going over to the park while she was on dialysis. And I, there's a Tualatin River runs right through Boone's Ferry Park. And I found myself in nature, I would calm down and become creative. Now they found through actual studies that being in nature increases your creativity 50% and it lowers your blood pressure and your, what is this called, the stress hormone, cortisol. And so that's when I started thinking, I need permission to do some things to help me deal with this. Because I was had all these years thinking like an engineer, I think the way to give myself permission and teach me to think more like a, a psychologist who has, and also think like a therapist was to write a poem and do a painting. So I wrote the following poem. It's called the Polymath Path. And it says, my fruit were the grapes of math that became the grapes of wrath because I'm an empath. I choose the vine to wine path who has the grapes of a polymath rather than the vine to dine path who has the grapes of a monomath. So I came up with this concept that my senses were like a Pinot grape. So I, one time when I, so I took up yoga and Tai Chi and I find yoga was much better for me because I, I was, uh, I have, <laughs> I am extremely energetic. I'm 80 years old. I go dancing. I dance for an hour without stopping and all this. And I, you know, and so I have this high energy. It's nice when you're older, but when you're a child, it's not very nice because I had trouble in classrooms. It would be hard. Classroom, yeah. Yeah, it's hyper. And so I go out and I end up being in the hallway more than at the in the classroom. So when I but when I got into the eighth grade, I I got in love with books. And I started making straight A's. And then I became a gifted student when I went into high school, went to Phoenix Union High School. And, uh, and I was a, that's a school with 5,000 students. And in my class, there were 765 students. And I go into my senior year as a seventh in the class of 765, which is really good. But then I got, then another hormone came along and, it, and I started getting interested in girls. And my parents from, got on me, you're studying too much, Barry. You need to socialize more. Uh oh, that's permission to go out. So I started dating and dancing. And my, I dropped to 35 but from seven. But I still got a scholarship so, <laughs> so, uh, to uh, Arizona State in the first year, which is amazingly, it was a hundred dollars a semester <laughs> in 64 and today it's thousands and tens of thousands of dollars you know and um, so so anyway I'm just saying Angela that uh, I believe from my own experience that becoming a polymath has been essential to my health as well as my survival even in older age, especially. especially. Especially in older age, because I discovered that I become more sensitive the older I get. Hmm. And that is, there are many papers on that subject, okay? And uh, so I, um, which is not what you think, you know? And, and uh, 
coupled with the fact the trauma of caring for my wife and then her dying in my home and my going through all that process makes me even more sensitive okay so so i'm at my peak sensitivity at 80 years old even more so than when i was younger but on top of that one of the main causes of alzheimer's is i believe and it seems to be based on the scientific literature it's being in a rut Mm -hmm. it's thinking one way and that's what a monomat does okay so the the key to and i did a presentation of this at the supporting the emotional needs of the gifted i believe it is in 2019 at, in San Diego called Be a Super Ager by Mastering the Power Flow of Your Mind. So what happens when you experience trauma of loss, like, um, like losing your loved one or even being rejected or losing a job or, or not passing uh, uh, an important uh, requirement or degree, it activates the the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula now this is a part of the brain that regulates emotions and then you experience pain i tell you grief is just like being cut it's just you're hurt but it turns out my brain is wired differently and barry kaufman wrote an article about this uh he's a friend of mine on facebook you know barry about barry kaufman yeah. Yeah. In fact, he he uh, he was at one of the sing conferences I spoke and I said, why is it that I'm more creative since my wife died? And when I experience rejection and pain, I'm more he says it's because you're wired that way. And so what he's what I he wrote an article and says people now we like to say everybody's creative. That's true. But there's but everything's on a spectrum. Yeah. Some are more creative than others. It turns out that what makes people more creative is a connection between the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula, which is called the default network. That's where you daydream. Yeah. But so I have this ability of I can daydream and then I can activate, they call them von economal neurons or mere neurons. And this these are the neurons that cause you to be an empath because they are, and you don't, I don't have more of them than the average person, but they're easily activated. Mm -hmm. And so they were activated when I, my my wife got sick and when she died, they were all, and all the experiences and the pandemic, they, they even activated more. But it turns out I have a connection between my default network and the executive network. Now the executive network is the prefrontal cortex. That's what tells you what to do that's what plans the future that's what that's the exact that's the entj okay and uh, but the anterior cingulate cortex is the infj not tj but after feeling and uh, and so so it's like these two are talking to each other so while i'm coming so i do yoga or i go out in nature I get all these ideas, but at the same time, I can plan how I'm going to implement that idea. Yes. I, you know what? I, I was just thinking about this. Like a lot of people associate polymathy with thinking because it means many learning. So it, it kind of has this implicit assumption or association with the intellect. But really, to be a full, real, robust polymath, you must embrace the world of feeling, of emotions as well, because that's part of who you are. And you've done that beautifully, Barry. You've you've been a logical, rational, engineer kind of guy, but also you're empathetic. You you feel what you feel, you know. And I think that's very brave of you to embrace those two things together. Some people tend towards one or the other but you found a way to sort of braid together both elements of your personhood to be who you really are yes and and the, thank you but the the thing is in here and you say in my poem 
I say, other people drained power from me, parents. My dad didn't want me to be emotional. He taught me to be stoic. But my mother was this highly sensitive stream. She had agoraphobia. She was codependent, all these emotions. And so here I had an emotional basket case and a stoic. I mean, which one do I become? I become both. both. And by nature, uh, by nurture, I mean. And uh, so I, and so it's confusing to me. I'm getting this information that is conflicting and paradoxical. So getting back to my model, I said, well, I'm an engineer and I do these power flow studies. So what we do, what I have a master's degree in is using digital computers back in 1968. This is real, real new stuff. And so in the good old days, they had a huge board and they would, they would have capacitors and resistors and inductors and and they would and they would tweak them and they would try to determine where the power would flow if they built this transmission line or this voltage and at this location and uh, but then they found they could use a digital computer and matrices and that's what I learned at Purdue. So my concept is that by doing paintings, by doing yoga, by writing poems, I'm doing power flow studies and I'm developing these power flow in my brain because I believe, and I, and I think this is where I get back to my metaphor, that transformers are potential volt voltage transformers. Well, a hydroelectric dam transforms the potential energy of water by dropping it through a penstock into a generator that turns the generator, generates electricity, transmitted on a transmission line to various loads in the Pacific Northwest and other parts of the country. That's the, that's the way the power system works. And that's the way I work and you work. My, my potential energy is emotions. Oh. That's why it's important to consider emotions when you want to uh, transform yourself. Absolutely. And here's so, another, go ahead. I've, I've, I've realized the more I've studied polymaths, understood them, and the more I've even reflected on my own journey, when your emotional world is not tended to, when you're in emotional crisis or or suppressing things, you know, it's hard to reach your intellectual potential, actually, it blocks. Like if you don't have over here tended to, it's really hard to be your intellectual best self. So there, it's really important. It's not just like fluff to deal with your emotions. No, if you want to reach your potential, you have to, you have to deal with the emotions and the intellect both. Otherwise the emotions can sort of derail your intellectual. Exactly. Life. And that's what I discovered is I try to suppress them. Then I get under stress and it would blow up like a volcano yeah, into exactly. rage. Exactly. And that doesn't do your relationships very good, you know? Sure. And, and uh, so that's what I meant by the floodgates overflow because mm -hmm. she wasn't there to control. And so emotions, when you have a dream, are usually represented by water, ocean or or stream and so so the water behind the dam is the potential energy and it does not become energy or kinetic energy until it's released yeah. and so when it's at a higher elevation mm -hmm. and, it, and it flows down a pinstock it turns the turbine and that turbine has a magnet in it and that magnet is then rotates and that rotation generates electricity. It converts the, the kinetic energy into electrical energy. Yeah. You know, one thing I wanted to observe and just mirror back for you too, Barry, is, you know, one of, one of, I call it one of the superpowers of being a polymath is this ability to do analogical thinking. 
to, to build analogies, to say, oh, this is like over here and sort of take lessons and tools and approaches from over here and, and see, do, does it work over here? And you do that beautifully, so frequently, like in your dreams and your poems and your paintings, you are Mr. Analogy. You give analogies all the time and you build connections and you do- So did Leonardo da Vinci, he did that a lot. Yeah. So I just want to give you kudos for being such an adept analogizer, you know, with your symbolism, seeing those connections where other people might not and looking for them, really. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this helped me. And when my job at Bonneville, so when uh, I tried to do, so I am an INTJ. INTJs tend to be very blunt. They tell the truth. They're very loyal. And I'm that way. And I found that I didn't do well when it got to politics and and um, I tell people what I really think and sometimes they don't like it, especially if they're high up. And, and incidentally, INTJs also, they don't respect authority unless they're competent. They don't respect incompetency. And, uh, and so uh, I'm working in the government. <laughs> There's a lot of quite incompetency. And... Uh, and you often they may be your boss, and you know, and and uh, so um, so I uh, found that they would so when I get in trouble, and they put me in a corner, and I would create some new thing. In fact, this whole thing, energy efficiency, that's something I created as a result of not being promoted. Mm. I I came up with this, and this guy retired was the energy efficient engineer. And so I came up and I, I hired a, they gave me a few thousands of dollars and I had a consultant develop a guidebook with me. And I call it, it's called distribution system efficiency. And that's what I literally did is go around talking to utilities, how they can improve their system efficiencies. And, uh, and so, so following up on what Tesla said, Tesla said, the secrets of the universe can be found in three things energy, frequency, and vibration. And Einstein said, uh, everything is vibration. And string theory is all based on vibration. You familiar with string theory? Kind of. You ever read, read uh, Dr. Green? Uh, he's written a book about it. And it's, and it's trying to explain uh, the big problem we have in our, our theories is that in, in the physics area or in engineering, is we have all we have all these different uh, energies, but they don't seem to work together. You know, Einstein had a real trouble with quantum theory. He didn't like it, and he didn't believe in the expanding universe and a lot of things. He didn't like about some of the theories that were coming out. But we need to understand that theories are just theories. Yeah, true. And I'm reading a book right now. It's called Empathy Diaries by by a woman, very intelligent woman. Her name is. Uh, Sherry Turtle, Tuttle, and um, and she said, and so she ends up in, the, in her memoir. And what she's doing is studying ways to think, ways to think. It's polymath is what she's doing, and she's still alive. She's a little bit uh, younger than me. She's about seventy-five now, I would say, and she was born in nineteen forty-eight, and I was forty-two. But but I think it's fine. She got in, into politics and sociology, but she said, and some and some famous professors say, theories are to be you have to, you need to be promiscuous with theories. Uh -huh. And and so I do this. I don't believe theories are dogma. They uh -huh. if whatever works, I take from. Dabonsky's positive disintegration. I take from electrical engineering. I take from uh, some of uh, the other books I've read. I take uh, Dr. Elaine uh, Aaron's, yeah, Aaron, Dr. Elaine Aaron's book, Highly Sensitive People. And I take a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and I can come up with what I call is polymath therapy. And I believe, in fact, I think uh, when I studied, started studying the uh, art therapy, eco, there's there's art therapy, eco theory, drama therapy. Uh, there's uh, narrative. There's what you call bibliophile therapy, bibliotherapy. There's all these ways of expressing yourself, and they're all. I think the key to it, because we're a multifaceted being, 
that the, all these, the more you use these, the more you become a holistic system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more robust, more versatile, more holistic. More adapt more, and you use the term in your presentation, you call them a one horse person or? One trick pony. <laughs> one trick pony, is that what you, so that's what I got, one trick pony. And that's what causes people to be sick. Now we get back to older people. The key to being uh, in my presentation, and I talked about this in, with 52 ideas, that uh, that being a super ager is same as, as being a polymath. I read these books about being a super ager. I read these articles. I read these studies. And I see the same characteristics of a polymath as being a a super ager and the and I get back to this concept that that um, Alzheimer's is often caused by what they call uh, anonode and it's uh, tangles I guess there's there's certain uh, kinds of uh, chemicals calcium that tangle up and they block the flow of neurons well you know when you go down the freeway and I had this one time with my GPS he said Barry you're there's a wreck up, up, up the way, take this ramp. And I take this ramp and I go right down on that wreck. And that's what you do in your brain. The more connections you have, you have some kind of tangles, andaloid tangles, I believe is what they call them, and uh, block your way, you just go like another path. And so these analogies help you connect new ways in your brain. And you know, it's a saying, it's just a, a cliche, but I think it's true, if you don't use it, you lose it. So as you age, it's important to have already established a pattern and a passion for continual learning. And because if you if you don't keep learning, my belief, and I'm not I'm not a, a neurologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, not expert in this, but it's my impression, just as, as a lay person in those fields, that if you if you stop using your thinker, it stops working. You know, it stops working so well. And I don't know, there's nothing quite as scary for me as like my brain not working. You know, that would be a really scary reality to live in, to not be able to think for myself. So I just, it's it's another benefit of polymathy of throughout the lifespan, the whole lifespan, even in the eighties and nineties and for, you know, people at, at any age, absolutely any age, even children, keep learning. Don't stop, like keep questioning what you believe change try new things and not just thinking either but but use your bodies and your emotions to have the full human experience as well and i think that helps not only to live a richer fuller truer more authentic life but it will also better position you for aging so that you still have your faculties with you yes i think uh, being a polymath evangelist is what you are i am <laughs> And I think you're on, if it's a religion, I'm like, no, no, I'm not like a religious evangelist. I just so believe in, in, in polymathy that I consider myself a, a promoter and evangelist. That's what yeah, well, it, yeah, well, there is a, a Japanese, I can't remember his name, author that wrote books about Max and about Apple. And he was called an Apple evangelist. So, so, and if you look up the word evangelist, it means promoting a certain idea. But uh, uh, you're most likely an ENFP, aren't you? Uh, yeah, you know, I am an ENFJ. I think I'm probably less J than I used to be. I've sort of relaxed a bit. You know why I know that? Because wow. you know what the you know what an ENFP is? Wow. Their whole drive is to champion a cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, I'm, this I, you're predisposed to do this. Yeah. by your personality and that's what my girlfriend she's an ENFP ENFPs and INTJs are good matches hmm. you you, know, your, husband might, your husband might be an INTJ I don't know I think it's awesome that you're in your 80s and you have a girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> well I, I have to have somebody running you know this energy I have I have a lot of energy at all levels and uh I also do erotic paintings as well. <laughs> I have to tell you, <laughs> they're in my bedroom, and and uh, and I don't, you know, I I'm thinking about writing a erotic novel, uh, erotic memoir with my paintings too. And but 
if it has to be adult. <laughs> awesome that you haven't stopped living you haven't stopped learning you haven't stopped exploring and trying new things and questioning who am i and who do i want to be and allowing yourself to evolve you know allowing well, to change. this is the key to be uh living it's with and uh, and as you uh as i told you earlier that you know the japanese developed this concept forest baby you've heard of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, and that's where you immerse yourself in the forest and uh and i last one of my last paintings is called uh, Forest uh, uh, Bath. No, I call it, uh, I call it uh, Tree Bath Path the Right Way. And I'm sitting down under a tree writing. So I found out that I have, because my brain is operating in a hyperactive way, I have, but there's another article, there's another study called Hyperactive Brain, Hyperactive Body. You Maybe you've heard of it. And I have that. And I find that doing creative things like writing, painting, it slows my mind. Mm -hmm. It slows my body down and it slows my senses, which causes me the key to forest bathing is slowing down and taking in the environment. And so when if, if I'm looking for, if I'm taking pictures, like the other night, I took a picture of the moon and it was peeking its way through the clouds and there was trees without leaves you know kind of pointing up towards the moon and i wrote this i said uh uh sherwood sherwood moon glows tonight with a eerie scary light <laughs> i like to do that i loved i love poe poe is he had the he could write poetry but the concepts also the words the bells, the bells, whatever, you know, and and I just love his poetry. And uh, and I like words that sound. And I what I love to do is talk about a concept and use words and sounds and pictures and smells and that that just bring all that concept together. And I can't say I can't you cannot help understand this concept. Every sense is involved in you. And and that's what I love to do is just, and, I, and in fact, this poem I just wrote you, I did a whole huge painting. It's on my one wall in my house, in my living room. And it's it's the power system of Bonneville Power. It's me doing yoga. It's with me and the grand and my house and everything. And uh, so I I try to take all these things and, and put them into an illustration, you know, to explain it. And uh, and then I had a problem when I went to I belong to Alamut Writers and I uh, wanted to write a, a book uh, with my paintings and my poem. No, there's nobody does that, you know. And and so so uh, uh, huh? You're like you you paint you write you do that. That's yeah, awesome. but they say that's not very. So I'm look right now. I'm I'm writing it, but I look for I'm looking for. If you have any suggestions for a publisher, I'm really interested. Because oh, okay. I my McGraw Hills, I I got a contract before I wrote it, and and I know that's not typical, but I'm I my problem as a polymath is it's hard to get myself, you know, on a right path. Because a lot of books, I want to tell you this. When you go to an agent or you go to a publisher, they want you to have the expertise in the subject you're writing about. When I spoke at Support Emotional Needs of the Gifted, and I was talking about neuroscience, they said, you're an engineer, you know, you're not a neuroscientist, it's just as you said earlier. However, you and we all understand if we're going to be physically healthy, we need to understand how our body works. Otherwise, we're going to do things to hurt ourselves. Doesn't that make sense? We need to understand how the brain works. Otherwise, we're going to hurt our brain. It's yeah, I agree. I want to circle back to, to something you said a minute or two ago regarding slowing down, like you were talking about forest bathing. And one thing, I've, I've just observed this in myself, um, and I'm curious, I'm going to share with you and then Maybe you can tell me if you think it's a good observation or not based on your experience. Um, I haven't had a nine to five job in a little over a year. And so mm -hmm. I spent 15 years straight, just staring at a computer all day, 
doing mm. work and it would drain my mental energy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> You know, and I was also in school for a lot of the time when I were and had a child and a household, you know, side oh, business. I just was so busy um, that I didn't have time to just slow down and let my default mode network that you also talked about a few minutes to just see what comes up when the act of thinking is allowed because there's clear, calm space to think. And, you know, I've had some of the deepest thoughts and insights of my life in this period this past year or so when I haven't been at a computer just giving my mental energy all day to someone else's goals and I'm curious you know you've been retired but but you've stayed busy and I'm curious do you find that when you're not working and you're able to kind of think and feel and express that you you think better more holistically more deeply I, yes, I think it's important that you understand your cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has their own cycle for sleep and eating and, and thinking. Some people are morning people, some are evening people. And when I went to college, I did all my homework at three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I too, and I think better in the morning, although I'm not a, what you call a morning person. I'm not very, I don't want to talk to people. Uh, I just want to, and so I do my best. I wrote my book. So six o'clock in the morning before I went to work. And so I think it's important to understand your own cycle and don't let other people dictate it. Uh, just like you said, don't be a one trick pony and, and it's understanding yourself. But I know one thing, if you're not have a, you certainly a good writer, you, uh, your, your article, your, uh, thesis i read it you know on pursuit of polymathy it's really good and uh i think uh, one of the things i would do if i were you is is to write about your experience that you've had since then the application of the pursuit of polymathy and in fact all these interviews you've done you could write a book on that yeah. many people do that That's you know so books i want to write and never enough time but you know i really i i I love thinking. I, I love, I mean, I, I'm happy to have a body. I'm happy to have emotions. I'm happy to have experience. Yeah. Well, you're more of an EF. You're less, see, Thank if you'd you love to think, you're, you're maybe you're an ENTJ, you know. Uh, I so only, I think I you're a and respect feeling. And I yeah. think probably more wisdom in feeling. Yeah. And in thinking, there's more um, achievement, maybe, or yeah. observation. They're different, but they're both yeah. useful. But I really do love possibilities and how can we make the world better? And how can you keep you journals? You keep a journal? Kind of. On my phone, I keep, I, I write my I keep thoughts. seven journals, you know. What? I have seven journals I keep. Wow. I write one for dreams. Okay. So I have, and I buy, I buy, I buy one from Amazon they're called a standard diary and they're and they have each year each day and it's and it has on the front the year and I have hundreds I've had them since the 80s okay I have hundreds of them and and I keep uh but I've evolved because the subjects I'm interested in so many things that writing it down so there's a book called write it down make it happen and and what it does when you write something you know longhand not not on the computer. It's not the same to put in like this. Okay, it yeah. it so the the physical act of writing it goes up here into your brain and it activates the what they call the reticular activation system. It's right back here in the back of your head, and that's when when you for instance if you buy what kind of car you got a Honda Odyssey minivan. That's that's what I thought a Honda. And so, so when you bought it, everywhere you were, you saw a Honda, right? Yeah, you notice what what your prime yeah. You see. Yeah, yeah, so that's so that reticular activation system is your radar, and it's looking for. And so, writing it down activates that part of your brain, and that's and it causes you to want to do that. So you want to be careful what you write down. If you're angry at somebody, I want to kill that guy. You don't want to do that because you might do it. So. So, but I'm just saying the 
power of writing it down longhand is can change your life. It is a life. And if you have that kind of, and so I keep seven journals. I keep one about dreams. I keep one about, uh, uh, I write a poem every morning. I just, you know, and I write a, uh, then I write, and now right now I'm working on the memoir. So I keep a memoir. But not only do I, the, the journal doesn't, is not the words of the memoir. It's telling me what to do in order to write the memoir. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. And so that's, to me, I use journaling to, for observations and ideas and, and, it, and for planning. I'm going to do this. Then I also keep a yoga journal. I keep, I'm, I'm interested in learning. I'm not very good at this, but I do play the piano and I want to write, I want to compose music that fit my, uh, poems and paintings and uh, and so I have a journal for that too and uh, see then I what's the other one I have a, a journal for reading so what I'm reading now and what my reaction that reading is and then one for painting too so all the things I'm doing I have to because when I sit down and, and before I paint I have to plan what I paint you cannot I'm not a Van Gogh that just takes a bunch of and, or a or a John Jack Pollock, he used to do dip, 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 you know, and uh, I uh, I planned it out and, and I tried different media. Right now I'm really interested in, uh, so I have difficulty with faces, okay? And I have difficulty with details. As I and TJ, I, I, I general things I like. So I came with this idea. I print out on my printer a picture of what I want to create and it's not, it's, it's usually abstract concept, okay, that's shown in reality. And then there is this, you can get this uh, podge and you can transfer what you, uh, from a printer to a piece of wood. Oh. And then I take the wood and I paint over it with my painter, with my brush, and then I paint, what, and then I glue that to the photograph, I mean, to the painting. It's just a technique I developed myself. These are all, you know, the mirror, when he did the woman with the pearl earring, he used what they call camera obscura. Hmm. And Rockwell and all his wonderful paintings, he had a projector. He projected on the wall. So wow. so it's even these great artists uh, we look to look up to, they they use technology to help them. And so I think the key is as an engineer is use technology not to um, be the master, but it's the slave. It is supposed to be for us. This is the fear I have about AI. AI can become our master, but we need to be the masters of our own technology. How yeah, we created it. How we create a monster. And and so, um, so what I do is I take pictures and then I combine them together with an app called Blender. Then I then I print it out and then I then I blow it up and, and I play with it. And then I, I do about a dozen, 20 maybe different pictures before I come up with what I like. And then when I finally like it, then I paint it. And But it takes a long time. It takes me two or three months to paint a painting. I just don't do it suddenly, you know. I love that you're like, oh, I use this app. And, you know, like you're so high tech for an 80 year old. <laughs> but I'm an engineer. I mean, uh, give me a break. You know, I've been with computers. They're like, you know, since the sixties. So I, you know, one time I, uh, I was in a, I was in a, you know, writer's conference and, and I was asking technical questions and he said, Oh, you're an old guy. You don't know anything about it. And I said, did you read my book? <laughs> and I pulled out one of my books and, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, the thing I've discovered, if you keep your mind active, at least in my case, that, you, you can be a better polymath than you were when you're younger because I did do poetry back in the 90s. I did take drawing classes in the 80s. I did take piano lessons in the 80s. So I did all these things that I'm doing now sometime in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing them all at once now. Now you get to have, I mean, as a retired person, you can really use your time as you wish and you can bring together all these elements of your of a lifetime. Yes. You have so many tools in your toolkit. 
It's all, and the, this is what I can understand why people don't want to retire. And, and so I was, I wanted to retire when I was 55. And my, and my wife said, oh, we can't afford it. And I said, oh, well, why don't we live on my retirement income? Because I work for the government, I can calculate to the cent how much I was going to be, how much my take home would be. And so we lived on it and we set aside all the money that I, extra money, and we used that for a trip when we went on. Um, and, um, and my wife said, yeah, we can do it. And, and uh, what I found out that my, if I would have continued working, I was getting paid $2.49 an hour. That was a difference between my retirement salary and my working salary. $2.49 an hour. That is not, that is below poverty to work. And, and then I discovered, because I no longer set a money in for a pension, I no longer, my income tax deductions uh, were, were not as high. And, and, and I did no longer had to set aside seven and a half percent for pensions that my take home. And then I paid off my mortgage. My take home income was about the same. So I discovered if your focus isn't on material things and money, it, and it, as long as you make an adequate living, that is not what motivates you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What motivates you, what motivates me. And I took a test for this is ideas. Yeah. Get an idea. I want to bring it to fruition. And and that and if you have that kind of person, you you're. I don't know what you mean by I was getting paid two dollars and forty nine cents an hour. There was a difference between my retirement salary and my working seventy two dollars. That's Siri talking to me. <laughs> she doesn't. That's Siri on my Apple Watch. She's talking. She says, I don't understand what you're talking about, Barry. <laughs> And she speaks with an Siri. You're so cool. yeah, yeah. Well, I was walking back from my my. Uh, I go to the library almost every every day. Yeah, I go. I have I have a, I have to be kind of honest about. I have 80, 90 books out of the library right now, <laughs> and I I keep the light. And I'm always using interlibrary loan. I love these because you can see. I I read stuff that you know. I can read the basic stuff. See, I can read up to thousand words a minute. So. So it's, you know, if I'm really interested. Do you know other people in your age range who who are as alive and vibrant as you are, as versatile as you are? No, <laughs> <laughs> no that's why I don't hang around with old people. I, I, I can't. <laughs> they, they always come up to me while I'm dancing and says, well, Barry, what you, <laughs> what's going on? See, last time we went dancing, oh, we went dancing to an Elvis personator. It's a, and because uh, we both, Sabrina and I like uh, Elvis, you know, from the 60s and 70s. And, but anyway, one guy, we were dancing on the corner and he took, and he followed us. Doo -doo 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 -doo, and he came, oh, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> and I hate that because I, I'm, and, uh, but I'm super energy and a lot of people like to come up and high five me, you know, and hug me and don't, don't do that because it drains my energy. It drains me when people touch me and interrupt me while I'm dancing. And, uh, but um, yeah, well, I got high blood pressure and I, and I have to, and that's another reason why I like to get out in nature is keeps my blood pressure down. And also these, these, uh, these things that I do are really reduce my blood pressure. I get, and then I have uh, di diverticular. Well, these are all common things. 84 million people in America have high blood pressure and diabetes is very high. I have, I am pre-diabetic if I don't watch what I eat. So I'm, I'm on a pretty much all fish diet. I don't even, since the pandemic, I don't do any dairy. I don't do any uh, wheat. I'm gluten-free and I, and I don't do any eggs. I don't all these. I just cut these all out, and um, I get bloated if I did. And uh, so I, yeah, I make some conscious decision. It's not a accident. My father died when he was seventy six, and my mother was developing early stages of Alzheimer's in her eighties, and she died when she was eighty four, and she aspirated food that they force fed her, 
because they gave her a drug that made her hallucinate and uh, it was horrible and, and uh, so anyway it's uh, but I have this personality which you know INTJs are uh, I suppose I'm talking about things that a lot of people don't know what I'm talking about I means in, in, introverted N means intuitive T means thinking J means judging versus perception but INTJs or masterminds they they tend to um, uh, per, they like their being they they have a personality that being um, their own person is more important than fitting in. Yes. Oh, let's talk about your painting. Create. Oh yeah. Let, can we talk about the? This is my favorite painting you've made: the create versus conforming path. Can you tell well, us this, about painting? Yeah. This is a. So I got this idea when I was over at Shampooy Park, which is near here where I live, and there was this path that went two ways one went down the river and one went up the hill and uh, so I came up with this idea and I have a sign there that says create another one says conform and the conform is you go like it and uh, because old people if you go to uh, the I live just next door to the you know the senior center in Sherwood and they go and they complain they backbite they gossip they they bitch about their aches and pains and and they brag about their surgery and and uh, and then so I actually did, working on a painting of, I'd rather go the Milky Way than the senior way <laughs> and uh, so and I actually be walking on the walking on you know clouds and, and stars and anyway this this shows that oh you know and then then it goes off this way and it guides up like this, you know, and, and then I show, if you look carefully at my painting, the electrical generator. So it's all about how you think oh. determines where you're going in life. And, and if you're, you know, if you're open to new ideas and incidentally, that's, and if there's another personality test called um, Phi Big Phi. Mm -hmm. And one of them is openness. Okay, I'm open, and and uh, and the thing, and that's really the key: the creativity is being open to change and open to ideas and and try this and try that, experimenting, mm -hmm. experimenting. Mm -hmm. And I even during the pandemic, you were talking about grounding. I tried grounding on the in the dirt or in the grass or in my house or on my deck, and and I. And I recorded how I felt under these conditions, try to determine where was the best grounding place. <laughs> and so you can you can do experiments with yourself. You can be a guinea pig, you know? That's yeah. you know, it's that's what's exciting about it. And but um, anyway, uh, I get with old people and even some young people, my one painting of my one of my my children one of my children don't didn't like some of my paintings you know because they said bury your nude in that painting i don't want to see you <laughs> and uh, so um that's why i say progeny progeny they don't like their parents to be different they want them to be like the other ones they want so we live in a culture that wants in america not the same in other cultures but and in India and Japan, they respect the older elders more than they do in America. But in America, in fact, I ran into a family yesterday on my walk. Uh, they were Chinese, American Chinese, and boy, they you know they were very friendly to me. And uh, and the, and one woman taught Chinese to elementary kids, and and I was asking about. I said, "Oh, this is a fantastic opportunity to learn." I said, "I want to learn Chinese. How would?" What is the most famous poet in China, in his, Chinese history? And it's Li Bray, B-R-A-I, B-R-A-I. So this is an opportunity to learn something from, so I got this idea. You might be interested in this idea. Is, because um, I believe there's a connection between empathy and polymath. Okay. I think what drew me to be a polymath was my empath. If I was not an empath, I would have probably continued my, my the, you know, the way I was going. It's because I absorbed all this energy. I had to learn how to use this energy so it didn't destroy me. 
so I could use it. So, and polymathy was the way to do because the more uh, I use, more skills I get, the more ways I can use my energy. Yeah. Okay, and and so I'm really interested. Are there in other cultures, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, all these different that have ancient histories? What did they? What was their experience with polymathy? Oh. And 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 I do know, and we can look back in some some of the cultures in in American cultures, like Ben Franklin, the, uh, Thomas Jefferson, they were polymaths. A lot of our founding fathers. In fact, when I went to Monticello, you ever been to Monticello? Yeah. yeah well, it's, it's designed with a huge dome, and and it's got all these underground tunnels, and 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 it was designed by. Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, he was such a polymath for sure. Man. And Ben Franklin, look at him. He was a he was a artist, and he was and then he was a scientist, and he was he invented spectacles. He invented the the Franklin stove and he, and electricity from lightning, and 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 then he was a politician and a diplomat and all kinds of fantastic things. So. So these are our founding fathers uh, were all polymaths and yeah. a lot of them are polymaths, you know? And I, so there's, there's, uh, I don't understand why people are so resistant. I think they fear uh, that it's going to, um, uh, I don't know, maybe they hold their identity to, to monomath. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's the problem with people. We get into a profession and their whole personality is based on it. But I think quite frankly, Unqu unequivocally that as we get into more AI and and you know with this new app that the chap what they call it, chap it that you can yeah it's gonna and so it's the people that can think different ways most computers cannot think in a polymath way you know they can't find that they have different look at data in Star Trek he had trouble with emotions let alone analogies and jokes. Jokes are all based on analogies. Mm. You know what? I had this realization yesterday. I, I've been thinking a lot about, okay, what is the role of the human being in the age of artificial intelligence? And one of the things I realized is that tech is meant to be programmable. And humans, we're programmable too in some ways, although yeah. not, but we are programmable through our society, our culture, our parents, our traumas, the language, the content, the media, we are programmable beings. But the difference is we can go rogue. We can decide, oh, I don't like that program I got. I'm going to switch it. I'm going to self-author. And I'm not sure technology can self-author because we will be programming them and tell the, telling them how to function within certain guide rails and certain barriers. And that is one of the differences. And that's why it is so important to be able to think because there's so much misinformation that will be coming at us. And, and some of that information, we're in the age of information, but it's the age of misinformation, really, because there's so much um, contrasting information that comes at us. So it's more important than ever to really be able to think critically and to not be programmed, oh, you know, avoid being programmed. That's what I did with my children. Instead of teaching them, I, uh, uh, I did teach in the Bible and, and, but I also taught them alternative religions. Mm. I used to teach well, classes so yeah. they could evaluate what religion, but I mean, I'm not going to, I don't feel like I should program my children. I should give them the tools so they can program themselves. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what everybody should be able to do. Barry, one other question. Um, we've been going for a while. I, I feel like we, how are you doing on energy? Do you think we should wrap up or should we keep going? No, I, I feed on this. Give me a break. <laughs> well, okay. I want to ask an important question because you you are the elder Barry, the elder Barry okay, in the polymath place group. I don't feel like it, but I, I guess know. So. How old, by the way, can I ask you before I go into that question, how old do you feel on the inside? Um. No, nah, I don't feel old on the outside either. I just sometimes forget and I, I you know, I got to remind myself not to overdo something. I, because I do have, a, um, yeah, it's uh, not until I look in the mirror. I don't really. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's hard to, you know, and 
okay, I have a real problem with, so Eric Erickson, you know, you know, it's famous psychologist and sociologist. He wrote about the seven stages of, and so the seventh stage of our life is, uh, you know about this? Despair, yeah. dignity. You have a choice. And that's what this is. This is really Eric Erickson's, this thing right here. Despair or, what do you, what's that? Huh? Dignity. And what is dignity? Dignity is being yourself. Yeah. Authenticity. Not and being humanized. Not being, and, but everything around us wants to, I want to tell you, Sabrina, and I go to visit my children. Sabrina and I go visit her children during Christmas. We're invisible. Aww. That's the way it is. And and then you go visit with older people, like I said, and they all they want to do is bitch, complain. And and because they're despairing that their life is coming to an end. Aww. You can say, oh, I'm so, I'm going to die in five years, 10 years. I, my concept is, oh, I only got 10 years left. I better get moving. <laughs> you know, that's a great lead into one of the questions I wanted to ask. I believe you, you're you very vibrant, and I think you have a, a lot of life left to live. Your your tank is still pretty full, right? Yeah, my, doc, my doctor said, you know, he said, you ought to be in the book of Guinness Book of Records is what he said. <laughs> even in your 80s. And but I want to ask you, because I think everybody should ask themselves this question, regardless of their age. What do you want your legacy to be? After well, you're gone and people remember you, what do you want people to think about you? Not that it matters what people think, but you know, they're gonna think something. What do you hope is the clearest vision that people could see of you for how you lived your life? And the choices you made. Well, I think that's one of the reasons I really worked on this because I didn't, you know, because I had a tendency to get rage and angry, and I says this, and I didn't want to be grow be remembered as a grouchy old man <laughs> or an angry old man, and I could see myself going that direction, and 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 that's really what's driving me around this memoir. I have a real concern about my paintings. Where are they going to go? Are they going to go into a dustbin? And where or do I form a I mean, I'm not rich like some famous people that can, uh, you know, and and uh, so I that's why I'm writing this book. The best way of legacy is to have a book. And uh, and I always thought my legacy would be my children. But I find out my children, they want to reject everything I say. You know, that's the way they go, the way it goes. It's not try to get your children to be your legacy. They really aren't your legacy. They're, They're people. Things. They're their own person. That is not right. And your legacy is is your fruit, your fruit. And the fruit has to be something external. It cannot be just you. And that's why writing, painting, uh, composing, these are the key to your life. And, and as a consequence, I'm more driven to do these things than I am before, you know, when I was younger. And, uh, and like I say, a book is, a, and that's why I want to put my paintings in a book. And, but I want to explain them. I want them to be, uh, I actually was had this idea uh, maybe 20 years ago. I just got this idea. Wouldn't it be cool to have a gravestone? And in that gravestone, there's a chip of your all your life experiences. And somebody could come in and jack into your chip and and suddenly appear a holograph of you, and they could say, Barry, what did you do when you were in high school? And and it would talk back to them. Oh, that would be super cool. Love use that. AI, the AI to to use AI to preserve and and communicate your well, I had this idea, and it turns out there is in California near Hollywood a a uh, cemetery where you can go into, uh, I don't know, I have never been there. I just read up read about it. But where they do have gravestones that do have, uh, you know, at that time it was CDs, but now it's just a chip or just, you know, that you can put on it. And, uh, and that you can, uh, especially actors and actresses who have a lot of movies and stuff, then you can plug into it. But I think what's really cool is now you can ask questions and, and you could develop uh, 
I don't ever see the movie Superman and how Superman's talking to his father back when he was uh, living on on uh, Kryptonite on Krypton, and uh, and he's telling him, giving Superman advice from. And uh, you remember this? Mm -hmm. The how it was at the at his uh, what do you what do you call Crystal Palace of Sanctuary up in Antarctica, and uh, well, it's the same idea, same idea, and uh, and they get a lot of ideas from movies, you know. And uh, and you know and and uh, this tremendous uh, lot of ideas. I my greatest interest when I was in high school was sci-fi. I read Doctor Smith. Doctor Smith wrote the the Lensman series, and it was in the fifties, in the old days when they believed there was an ether. And and I read all of Highland's books and Doc, and Isaac Asimov and and. Uh, and Van Vach, uh, he wrote uh, all kinds of this, and 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 all these things that we're living now are just a figment of the imagination of the sci-fi writers from fifties and sixties, and yeah. during the you know, and and Elon Musk is a polymath. Oh, for sure. You know. Yeah. You know, and uh, and he's going off in SpaceX. He's going off in Tesla. He's going off in. And what is this Neuralink? You know, you know his latest thing is Neuralink, and so, and so, uh, and he's an INTJ, no question about it. And and um, so and so is Putin. You know, he's an INTJ too. So there are, and Darth Vader is an INTJ. So you know, <laughs> you can be, uh, you can do, you can be a villain, you can be a, a hero. It's it's all how you use it, you know, and your values and. And, uh, but uh, in fact, that's what they like. You know, um, uh, what's it, Cumberbund, the, the guy that played uh, uh, Doctor Strange? He's an INTJ, the INTJ, you know. And, and Einstein was an INTP. See, INTJs have a tendency, the INTPs, they like to stick to the same thing forever. They, whereas INTJs, they get tired of this and they go, they're natural polymaths, okay? They they get tired of this. They go over this. They go over this, this, and then I like to connect all these things. Yeah. And okay. see, they, they, this every you know what Leonard da Vinci said: everything is connected. Everything is connected. Yeah, that's one of the harder parts of polymathy. I think you know Michael Araki has a great model. He talks about breadth, depth, and integration of of your polymathic knowledge. He represents it in a an infinity sign, and the the getting breadth and depth people can easily do that over decades and a lifetime you can get breadth and in, in multiple subjects and you can develop multi-expertise okay Paul but there's a way of bypassing that you can so you get depth in something you don't go back up and do another one you tunnel underground yeah and then you you so i can go into neuroscience and relate it to electrical engineering i can go to psychology and related to electrical so i have the depth of one subject electrical engineering i was i was writing books i was going all over the world and but i lost I, I, this is this is but it it had no relevancy to who i am that's the problem with our professions and that's the problem with phds they're all specialties and and i was going to get a phd but that's what kept me from doing it. I don't, number one, like to be under somebody's thumb and what you are under your counselor's thumb. And then I don't like to be, I. so when I wrote these books, Angela, I was exhausted emotionally after I finished it because my mind wanted to go somewhere else. And I didn't want to talk about power quality. I didn't want to talk about <laughs> like, It's. I've had it. I'm done with that. But if I, if that's why I'm trying to write about polymath things, and, but I can't, I find, I find, I, and I want to ask you about this. I was struggling with what to call my book. I call it energy efficient, transformed me, or do I call it empath, polymath path? Do I call it the polymath nature path? But I, I find the words empath and polymath have so many, uh, controversial meanings and but if you energy efficiency transform me 
seems to relate to what I did before, but it also has less of, I don't want to, I don't want to confuse people. I want to communicate to people. And I find these, these terms are kind of. I like transformed me. I like, like, I like the transform concept because you, you did transform your life, right? Like you, you've made, yes. you built your life. You've. And and transform this too. Yeah, you, you've done work on yourself. That's clear. You've designed, you've intended, you've gone with the flow, you've gone with the flow, but you have steered your own ship. And so I really like this concept of, of transforming yourself, you know, being your own transformer. So I like that word for your book. Um, I want to circle back real quick to the integration, uh, you know, the Michael Arrakis. Integration is better than time management too. <laughs> time management you only have a limited amount of time on this world and each day but integration is a way of circumventing and transcending time hmm. what else comes up because it's okay it seems to me that you do a lot of analogizing you sort of compare over here like you know you're very adept at that and the symbolism and drawing the connection so you are an integrator you integrate, I mean, you were talking about your five senses and like doing things holistically and systems thinking and systematic approaches, holistic. Yeah. And you know, in my view, it's the integration that's the hard part of polymathy. That's where people don't quite go all the way. They can get the, the, the breadth and the depth. They can get that. But it's the integration that some polymaths are, are not all that skilled at and you seem to be so what comes up for you when you reflect on your own ability to to integrate and to connect and to analogize and symbolize and and think holistically like how do you do that so myers briggs uh, is a very controversial personality <laughs> some say it's a bunch of hooky and it was developed by myers and it's based on young psychology and it's not really based on uh scientific like uh, the five five principles for, and and so but there's so as a result there is this one doctor i think a dario dario i want to call him and he wrote a book and so he decided to use myers briggs and do an em uh, fmri on each one of them to see if there was a signature associated with their personalities and he found out intjs when they're come up with the idea and they're planning that idea the brain turns blue they have a blue mind and so when i have an idea and i can connect that idea to other things i've done it is exciting my brain lights up and also i, I got Hey, introverts have a low dopamine requirement. I don't need as much dopamine as other people, and and to and dopamine is a reward, you know. What do they call it? A neurotransmitter, I guess. And and uh, so, uh, so I have. What's the matter? The pharmacy of your your brain is sort of like a pharmacy making making yeah. drugs administered. Yeah, and, and so I love analogies. So there's this one. YouTube video, you got to look at it. It's really fantastic. How is a synapse performed? And so they have this one guy, He's he goes out there and there's this big, huge gap between two places. Okay, it's, and there's a canyon. And so he comes up with a method for building a bridge when he can't get to the other side. So he throws a line across and, and then he builds a bridge like this and then he can walk across it. And it's all done on a YouTube video. And that's how a synapse develops. And, and you, you know, you, you throw up, and I think I'm visualizing that because that's how we develop new pathways in our brain. And this is why I think it's important to talk about pathways. When I talk about a nature path or a polymath path or an empath path, it's really not a path outside, it's a path inside. Mm -hmm. it's, so if we form a path outside and it matches the path inside, so what is the key to integration? It's harmony. Mm. So what what really gives gives makes your bell ring is when you what your all these things that are going on you are in harmony with you and your environment. That's what yoga is all about. Yoga means unity. 
Yeah. It's all, it's all, and then that's what the Bible's about. It's all being in harmony with God and, and, and the environment. And there's many Bible verses about you find God in nature. He says, there's no excuse not knowing God because he's in his, our, his, his creation. And so I, and so I find a lot of these analogies are in the Bible and, and yoga sutras and, and, and different books. And so you can, if you, you can, the great thinkers are great stealers too, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, but it's being able, I don't want to be a duplicate of what somebody else does. I, when I wrote the second book, I had to make 200 permissions to use their pictures and, and quotes. And I got so sick of asking permission. And I want to, my next book, I want to not ask anybody's permission because it's original. Huh. But uh, so I, I am driven to be original yeah. and, sure. and not, not, uh, and not be a copy. And, and, uh, but I guess that's a characteristic of my personality, but the, you go out into the, the world with, I want to tell you, Angela, is that, I, I've been over the senior center. I wanted to learn how to dance. I went to a dance class over at the scene on swing, East Coast or West Coast swing, you know, and and I went in there and and we were about maybe five of us, six of us. And and pretty soon I was dancing with this woman and this one guy said, oh, he's doing it wrong. He's doing it wrong. And they were all yelling at me. And I said, hey, I only got one teacher. I won't. And they were making all these people's teachers. Everybody is judging everybody else. And I said, give me my money back. I don't need that. And and I do not like being trained by judging, by shame, uh, because I learned by, not by discouraging me and by embarrassing me. That just makes me, that's how I have found the polymath place. I tell you, I was in Willamette Writers at one of their, uh, and I started telling things I was doing. Oh, you're a genius. You've been, you know, I'm a, woe is me, you know. And so they, people want to make fun of you for, for being smart. They want to make fun of you for many, doing many things. And instead of encourage, we just live in a very judging culture. It's a very anti-culture. That's why I talk about my poem, pedagogues, parents, peers, preachers, professionals, and progeny. They all oppose me for being a polymath. Yeah, it's the way, and you got to be willing to take the flack. It's got to be more important to go your way than it is to. And I just watched last night. Um, uh, was it Inkerberg, Hunk of Dink, and and Tom Jones singing "My Way"? <laughs> you know, that's one thing I wanted to observe too. If this was a way that you did not conform, you to gender expectations because you're male and. You were raised by a father who did not emote, who was very stoic, right? Um, and you're, although your mother was sort of a feeler, um, you're a man. And especially in the day and age that you were raised in, in and, you know, adult in, you know, before in the past, it wasn't kosher. It wasn't expected for a man from your generation to have an emotional life to feel right. that's why it's taken me 80 years to do it <laughs> i mean i have all, to unlearn all these things you know what did einstein say is i spent all my life uneducating myself the things i learned and so much so much of what we learn and uh yeah and and what happens with parents is that they like to they like to create uh, clones and uh, and that's what my dad was doing he was trying to create me like Thank God I'm not like him. I would be dead. He was a smoker and an alcoholic, and and my mother was uh, de codependent and and an agoraphobic and and uh, so why is it that I'm not like them? That's a good question. Why is it they have black hair and they have brown eyes and I have blue eyes and when I had hair I was all I was a toehead. I was blonde. Why am I so I'm not only uh, I look different. Not only am I different, I look different. And my, and my sister, she's five years younger than me, and she died in 2018, five years younger than me, and she died of high blood pressure. And uh, so why is this? What's going on here? 
what's causing me to be, and I did a lot of research. I did a lot of genealogy trying to understand where I come from. And I find out I have, that I come from, um, on my dad's side, uh, Mormons. Uh, in fact, uh, Charles Kennedy, my great, great, great grandfather, he was a, he was a um, adopted son of Brigham Young. And, uh, and he was, but he was a very, very hardy person. He lived to be 84, which is very unusual in the 1800s. And he went back and forth to the United States. On, so I have an extremely hardy body. I mean, the things I've been through, I would have killed other people, you know, and I've been very fortunate. When I was in England, I almost got run over because I forgot that, you know, you drive on the left side. The other right? side. <laughs> but I wasn't driving. I was walking across the street and I, I looked and then, whoa, whoa. <laughs> well, what's his name? Uh, McCartney the, from the Beatles. His ex-wife got, got a leg taken off in England for a bus. He took her leg right off. But they're from there. They should know. <laughs> I know, they should know. But I was, I have a good excuse. But uh, but anyway, I, I just, um, I like, uh, right now I'm more interested in not traveling, traveling the mind is what interests. And my girlfriend wants to go to France. She's really, in, she's studying French and everything. So I'm interested in going to France and going to a place where it's eco-therapy, eco-art. I'm interested in how artists, um, you know, use, um, how can you use art and uh, and poetry as a medicine, you know, that's what I'm really interested. In. I'm interested in, and you know, in Japan they they prescribe uh, nature, just like you do prescribe a pill. We we so much into big pharma, and we want a pill for everything, but you know, and uh, so I feel like I have a mission. I told this to, I was yesterday to my girlfriend, and. And uh, you ever seen the movie Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise? Well, you know, they had it back in Jim. I think it was Arnaz was uh, back in the 60s. I think they had it on TV. You know, and he says, this will self-destruct in five seconds, you know, the tape. And, and, and I feel like this is my mission impossible. My mission is to tell other people how they can live a more vibrant and long and healthy life. Because that's what we're here for. We're here to live, not to die. You can be in your 80s and have a girlfriend and go dancing and paint and do yoga and forest bathe and write books and just do all the things like Barry does. And, and have he, lots of sex too. I, have lots, I wanted to ask you about that, Barry. I hope you're, if you're not comfortable, we don't have to. I'm comfortable with it. I just don't know if other people are. Sex necessarily. But I wanted to ask you about having a girlfriend in your 80s. Like, it, how, what is she like? How old is she? What do you do together? Like, is she vibrant like you are? You mentioned she's going to France. I'm like, oh, she sounds like she's living. She's living. She's alive. She uh, well, she's, and she's, so you'll get a kick out of this story. So we go shopping at Costco a lot. And so we were going shopping the other day and we were looking at Barbie dolls. And this one couple comes up and says, oh, you're going to buy that for your grandchildren? And I says, no, I have grandsons. They would be really angry if I got them a Barbie doll. It's for her. It's for my girlfriend. She's in the Barbies. She's been, she's uh, used to, so my girlfriend, her father was, he designed the chariots for Ben-Hur. And he was, a, he was a famous person and he did a lot of work in Hollywood and he designed the Queen Elizabeth uh, chariot for in Hollywood and and uh, so she worked for Nudie. Nudie was a famous um, fashion designer who built uh, costumes for Cher and Elvis and all these famous people. So she has a, she's a fashion designer and she likes to design Barbie doll clothes and she can do what she wants with them. And so she likes to set up these set settings of Barbies and, and she's really into it. And, and uh, it's a it's a creative hobby, okay? That's why I look at it. And uh, but she likes to likes clothes and, and styles. She also was a go-go dancer when she was younger. So that's where I get the and I like it. She likes we dance self style. Uh, no, we got freestyle. We don't dance anything. We just do I wiggle, you know, I wiggle to the to the rhythm. And uh and the movie, I mean the music uh, gives me energy, you know. And we know all the bands here in Sherwood and we go to a casino near we don't drink or gamble, we just dance. And uh 
So, but uh, yeah. Uh, did you meet her? And when did you meet her? How old were you when you got this girl? Well, we met her in 2014, right after my wife died. So what I, so I went kind of crazy after my wife died. I joined 32 meetup groups, and I, I had a Mercedes uh, 1996 um, C280. And I burned. I blew up the engine from running from one place to another. I had to buy another Mercedes. I have a C two three. I have a C. What is it? I have a C two eighty now. And uh, and it's a you know it's it's a twenty thirteen uh, Mercedes. It's still running. And uh, anyway, I met her online on OK Stupid, OK Cupid, <laughs> and and uh, we met. And early uh, 70s, right? huh? you were in your early seventies at that time. Yeah, uh, no, I would see that was 2014. So that was eight years, eight years ago, nine years ago, really. And so I was in, I was 71. And so, uh, so yeah, and she had just, her husband had died too. And they were married 36 years. And the same year, 2014, uh, he died in March and I and my wife died in February. So we had something in common. Yeah. And she's an ENFP, and and uh, and so uh, we dated a lot. I dated, bef- I made it several women before I met her too, and broke up with some of them. And uh, so uh, you know, I was, I was driven. You know, I think highly sensitive people, they seek out. So I have this kind of personality. It's called, uh, I, I seek stimulation as much as I do. Uh, so I like to, and you know, it's kind of a yo-yo thing. Big stimulation, I get overstimulated, so I withdraw and boom, boom, boom. So I'm learning how to deal with that. And you you probably have that too. You get you seek something and it and it overstimulates and then you withdraw. And so it, so pretty soon you learn to be careful about it. So so incidentally, we during the pandemic, we didn't go dancing because we, we were afraid of you know COVID and everything. So we stayed home and we danced in front of the TV and we there was a lot of Zoom dance things, you know. And but dancing is known to be a it in it uh, delays Alzheimer's. It's a very it's one of it's probably the best thing you can do. It involves the brain and the body. It's probably the best thing you can do for uh, for uh, as you get older. The dancing is a tremendous thing. But the problem is when I did they want you to dance. I learned Zydeco one time. I learned tango. I learned swing. So when I do things, I really do it. But I ended up in dancing the way I want to dance because all these these things they limit you, they restrict how you can move, and and but one of the important parts of expressing your emotion, emotions are somatic. Mm. They get they get buried into your body. That's why yoga and dancing are it gets that emotion, it, it releases it in the body. It's in the body. Did you know your gut is your second brain? Yeah. And you, and your heart gives out seventy times the amount of electromagnetic fields that your brain does, and so so there's a and and we're electrical, we're electrical chemical beings. For sure, you know, and and that's what we need to understand. And and uh, when I had a Nissan, uh, what do you call? Uh, you ever you know? I had heart, I have heartburn, so they have one that's off. Uh, operations that they wrap the stomach around your esophagus and it's an engineering thing you know it changes it so if you take a, a tunnel and you reduce the diameter and you increase the strength of it it increases the pressure inside the tunnel and so you increase the pressure in the stomach to be greater than than in and then in the uh, uh, in your esophagus then that keeps it from coming into your stomach Keeps uh, you know, you know, come, stuff coming up into your esophagus. No, you increase the pressure in your esophagus greater than the stomach, so it inhibits it from coming up into your and get heartburn. So they do, so they do this, opera, and you couldn't eat anything right after it. So while I was, so I read an article about this, about it's called La Paz's Law. What I just described to you, there's a formula for it, and I love this. I love math. I love models. I love 
I mean, this is what engineering is all about, is creating a mathematical model of reality. And it's the greatest thing. You can take, you can take a model in, in mathematics and you can create reality on paper and then you build it and it works the way you imagined it. Mm -hmm. That's what engineering is. Yeah. And engineering is, is doing those things for the good of humanity. Why can't you engineer your emotions? You can engineer your genes, your genetic engineering. Why can't you engineer your emotions? Why can't you engineer your personality? Why can't you engineer your life? That's so true. You know, I'm. that's making me remember when I was in my early 20s, I finished undergrad and my plan was to go to law school. And I'm not knocking anyone who went to law school, I swear. But I started studying for the LSAT. And it started to sink in like law school is going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of money. And then I'm going to have to work as a lawyer. Do I really want to do that? And I thought for me, in my case, this is not true for everybody. But I thought for me, if I, I can already be feisty, I can already fight. I can already be judgmental. <laughs> I don't need a career that's going to require that of me. Because that was my view. And I could be wrong. But my view of being an attorney was you're there to fight. Um, and I didn't want to or argue or argue. You're there to argue for sure. And I didn't want a constant battle. And so I made the decision to give up on my vision. And I had, in, I had interned in law offices. I had interned for the governor. I had set myself up, but I decided to engineer my personality and change my plan because after reflecting on it, I realized it was not the right path for me. And I didn't know what the right path was going to be. Instead, I just knew it wasn't going to be that. I can tell you the main thing. It's and I and I talked about this at the uh, at Fifty Two Ideas when we had this meeting, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And so I got in this argument with this one guy, and he was just really obnoxious about it. And uh, but anyway, uh, it's I told him it's better to connect than correct. So if you're a lawyer, you're there to correct. You're ready to to take the law and correct people to be your way. And but in, in polymathy, you're there to connect. And connect you feel ah, correct, you feel ah, it's tense. Yeah. Managing and, the energy state that you're in by what how you spend your time, the profession you choose to be in. Like we are responsible, you know, for the lives we create for ourselves. Of course there's things outside of our control too, but at the end of the day, who's most responsible for my life? Well it's me. Yeah. And it also you become your profession. It, yes. it 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 so if you choose a profession that doesn't suit you, so this is what I this is what I talked about earlier, Angie, is about that I had I chose a profession that fit my personality but did not fit my traits. Mm. You know, I a highly sensitive, empathic. I I had to bury those traits, and I'm paying the consequences of that now. I'm because I uh, my high blood pressure, my trouble with my digestive system. It's because of stress, and because I didn't express my emotions, uh, you know, in a way that's healthy. And and then this is what it's all about. They say the people that don't live the longest uh, are the ones that that keep their emotions. It's our emotions that affect our health, and it's and I think polymathy should not be so focused on just professional reasons or or against it but i think fundamentally it has to do with being who we are and it's not so much it's not the results it's the process that's why my pain is not about the results it's about the creativity is a process yeah. conforming what? is a result mm, yeah that's wise very um man we have been going almost two hours <laughs> I feel like, well, i'm gonna run out of energy i'm only 41 and I'm <laughs> i have not had all my breakfast uh so yeah so i gotta I eat my i had my covid booster today and i'm feeling uh you know you get which one did you have the third second one or the third one four it was my fourth well, it, I had the two and then I got my first booster and then I was at the doctor today and she's like, you need one more booster. So I was like, I have, oh. I have three boosters already. I have, I had the two and then I've had five shots. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this was my fourth shot, but I'm feeling a little. It's going to, yeah. And your arm hurts, doesn't it? 
my arm does hurt. So, and we've gone for two hours. So I feel like we should begin to wrap up. Um, sure. So I want to ask you one last question. Like you are the elder in our Facebook group. You're wise. You are brave. You are holistic. You know, you're an example for other people, especially in older age. And so I just want to ask you if there's any other life advice that you want to give to people who are watching this, whether they're older or younger people, it's up to you or just everybody. What is your advice, you know, um, for living a good life? It sounds very trite, but I say, listen to your thoughts and heart, not to what other people say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't listen to TV. Don't listen to uh, the crap that you're getting. And uh, formula, formula. Would check it out yourself. Try it out. Try it before you try it before you do it, and uh, before you use it. And and uh, it's you know. And, Life is uh, short, and 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 you know, and be willing to make mistakes, but don't make mistakes that that are going to ruin your life. And I think it's great to to learn to demo before you commit. And that's what, like I said, with my my retiring, I tried it out for a year, and uh, and I think that's true of many things. See, you don't have to totally commit to something. Like for instance, yourself, if you wanted to get into writing. Write some articles. Write to uh, become a freelance writer. I did that after I retired, and and I tried it. And I was an editor of a magazine, and and I didn't like it. I didn't like it because it it I don't like to do things that that uh, restrict what I can choose to do. So there is a problem. There is a problem. If you want to be creative, you need to be free to be creative. And if you start uh, joining a group or an ind or line with some individual and they will take away your creativity you can't be yourself if you're trying to fit in and uh so it's pardon me? your creativity and i would say it also kind of takes away your freedom your sovereignty yeah. your ownership of your own life when you conform when you take the path you know right i'm going to leave it just with one kind of uh kind of you know quotes from from my one of my be free, be like a tree. Be free. And a, and a tree, they grow, they grow uh, not because other people are telling them to grow, they grow because they want to grow and they give fruit because they want to give fruit. And uh, so be, be, be like a tree, be, be like me, be free. Yeah. Amen. I, Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> I loved I actually wrote a mission statement of my life saying I want to be like a tree and I said I said something like you know rooted strong but also flexible when the winds of change come as they will like are you going to bend or are you going to break I'd rather bend you know yeah. trees are well I intelligent and beautiful and a good example for us so this this painting I just did and I'll send it to you because it's kind of interesting is I did a printing of my being by a creek and, and being a tree. And then I was giving fruit of my books, you know, but my next painting is me painting uh, the po me painting the portrait, but me climbing out of the painting and my roots are coming out. So you need to have, you need to be grounded when you, when you're at home, but you need to, and when you're in the flow, but also you need to be grounded when you're on the go. Yes, good point. Good point. And so that you need to take those things with you, and and I think technology. Sometimes, if you take a, your iPhone with you, and you have things in there that, that like a, a scene from a, a ocean, uh, and you can take that with you. But I I do find that uh, look. I I believe this listening to you, you're probably an empath. Mm -hmm, definitely and and you become very and sin empaths are very become attached to people and things and uh and it's uh and one way of avoiding uh unhealthy attachments i mean even to your daughter you really love your daughter you take a lot of pictures of her and you become attached to her but there's going to come a time she's going to grow away from you yeah and uh, and and uh, the way to do that is to become attached to ideas. Hmm. Attached to ideas, they cannot take the ideas away from you. Hmm. 
That's yeah, that's a good point. And I would add too, like your value, you know, ideas, values are an idea, but you know, I actually have some of my values. Let's see if I can. Uh, and you're tattooed. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, it might be backwards. Truth, beauty, love. And I got my grandma who raised me right there, Georgia. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, she'd probably be about your age if she was still alive. And How was she? She'd be a little bit older. She died in 2003, a long time ago. Mm. She was born in 1933. She was 69 when she died. And she was an amazing person, not educated. You know, she was married at 15 in the late 1940s and they, they did it young when they my grandmother was a uh, grandmother she was married when she was 14 so yeah i mean that's how it was done back then and um you know she was a wife and a mom and she was she didn't even get a high school diploma but she was one of the most intelligent good good salt of the earth loving kind people i ever met and so i've really modeled my personhood very heavily after after my grandma. You ought to write a book about her. I know, I should. My daughter's middle name is Georgia after her. This is her, of course, when she was younger. She was probably about, I don't know, 20 or 21 or something there. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, people with doctorates can have tattoos. It's true. I'm making up my own rules for my life, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I can't be Dr. Angie with tattoos, all right? <laughs> you got to have another tattoo on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have two sleeves by the time I'm done. Just before I'm done. <laughs> yeah, but but wear show them off. You know what the heck? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's winter time, so I wore long sleeves today. But anyway, <laughs> it's so good to chat with you. Yeah, um, I'm so glad you're a part of the group and you've stayed so active in the group. I can't wait to share this with everybody else. And um, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. You have a good day. Have a good Monday. You too.